and the year is 1596 in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. I am an expert soldier and I have just been knighted by the Lord Admiral Howard at the Battle of Cadiz. But my story starts around about 700 years ago, in fact in 1329, when Geoffrey Gilbert married Joan de Compton. She was the heiress of what was then a small manor house here, just a few rooms. The de Comptons had owned the land for seven generations, ever since Ulrich de Compton had been given the land by the bishops of Exeter in 1138. But when Geoffrey moved in, they started to extend just like we still do today. Only today we're usually happy we turn our loft into a bedroom, nice en suite somewhere, conservatory on the back of the house, and we're done. But back then they had much grander ideas. They started with an extra wing, and then they added another tower. And then they and future generations carried on adding to the house. Another wing, another couple of towers. They added a kitchen block and yet more towers. Now all of this work did take best part of 175 years. But at the end of it they had the beautiful house that you see today. Sitting in a wonderful valley with fantastic farmland. And that's when things started to go wrong. Because the French and the Spanish started to send raiding parties to the southwest corner of England, they would attack large houses, see what they could steal. Now, a boatload of armed sailors would turn up near Paynton in Torbay and come across the fields. It's only three miles. Now, most of them would be carrying sticks and swords, spears, and pictures I have for the younger members of the group. Things like pikes. I describe them as spears with nasty bits added to the side. And that's when my great uncle, also Sir John, built the big wall around the outside of the castle. He built it 24 feet high. He built it nice and thick. He added extra towers. And all these towers were out from the castle so they could have lines of sight to fire along the walls of the castle. He added two portcullises. Some use me pictures again. Do you know what a portcullis is? Yeah? Okay, good. He added two of those to, to the front of the castle. Now the metal is long since gone, but the guides where they ran are still above the doors. You can see them out there today. He added all the crenellations, the bits that make it look like a castle at the top, the square bits. So there were lots of holes and spaces to throw nasty things at people. And he added all the arrow and the gun holes onto the front of the castle. So there were plenty of spaces to fire at anyone trying to attack the front doors. Now there's no record that we can find that says whether these defences were actually ever tested. So we don't know whether they would have worked or they wouldn't have worked. My view, against 40 men with sticks and swords, they probably kept them out. If any of you don't think so, we bolt the doors at half past four. I'll give you a stick and a sword, and you're welcome to try and get back in. <laughs> you won't, I promise you. I move on a little, and I come to the man who became my father. At the bottom there, Sir Humphrey Gilbert. That's just a copy of the picture that's in the Great Hall, the portrait. Now, he was actually born at Greenway. I don't know if any of you have been to Greenway. These days, it's a lovely white Georgian house. Agatha Christie's holiday home for 40 or 50 years. Back then, it was a small Tudor mansion, not that dissimilar to this. And it stood roughly where the croquet lawn is today. There's almost none of it left. There is a tiny piece of wall in the garden. And what I'd like you to do when you next go back, find a guide and ask them where the two window sills are that were taken off the old building to use in the new building and that will tell you whether you've got a decent guide or not <laughs> got <'em. laughs> i know <laughs> anyway that's where he was born and he grew up to be a soldier a very violent very ruthless very efficient soldier he was a sailor he was an explorer he was an MP for a while, but he can't win them all, can you? And he was a friend of the young Elizabeth, who grew to be queen. And he kept asking Elizabeth for, for support and help in his exploration trips. 
and she kept refusing. Eventually she said yes and she granted him a license. His job was to try and find a trade route to China round the top of Canada. Okay, now think of the world, yeah? We've got England here, Atlantic Ocean, America and Canada here, and his job was to sail right over the top of Canada to find China. He failed. But he did set up a colony in Newfoundland in Canada. It didn't last very long. It wasn't very successful. But in historical terms, hugely important because it marked the very beginning of the British Empire anywhere in the world, started by Sir Humphrey. Oh, wow. Now, of course, while he was at sea, he did have a second job. Here's a question particularly for you two. He was a privateer. What was a privateer? You're not going to know. That's cruel to ask you. A privateer was a pirate who worked for the Queen. Now, in public, Elizabeth would say to privateers, like Sir Humphrey and his half-brother, Sir Walter Raleigh, good afternoon, man. Good afternoon. He would say to them, she would say to them rather, you will not attack French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian ships while you're at sea. None of them. Slightly different in private. More like you will attack as many <laughs> French, Spanish, etc. He wasn't any good at the first part of his job. He never did find a trade route to China. But he was very, very good at the second part of his job. One of the things that tells us this is that Elizabeth supported a second trip for him, including sending him a large and valuable jewel. And if he hadn't brought back plenty of treasure on the first trip, he would not have got the support for the second trip. No way. Now, on his second trip, coming back from Canada, he was sailing in a tiny little ship called the Squirrel. That's just a photograph of the model we've got in the Great Hall. Now, the Squirrel held a crew of ten men only. It was little more than a decent-sized yacht, really. Anybody been on the replica of the Golden Hind in Brixham Harbour? A long time ago. A long time ago, yes, <laughs> me too. Yes, yes. Well, I'd advise you to go because it's a very interesting thing to see. And when you get there, it isn't an overly large ship, but it held a crew of 50. And then you'll understand quite how small the squirrel was with 10. Now, they were coming back from Canada. As it happens, they were accompanied by the Golden Hind. And the captain of the time, Edward Hayes, asked Sir Humphrey not to sail on the squirrel. He said, at this time of year, you will meet storms in the Atlantic. The squirrel is so small, she'll probably have trouble getting through. Come and sail with us. Now, we think it was a sense of loyalty. He had been with his crew, sailing around the coast of Canada for most of the year. He did sail on the squirrel. They did meet a storm off the Azores. The squirrel sank, and he and the rest of the crew all drowned. I always think this is a really good point to think about especially for younger members of the audience. Sometimes in life you will meet someone who really knows what they're talking about, about what is an important subject, and that's the time to get the ears working. <laughs> because if Sir Humphrey had listened, he would have got back with the golden hind. It had no problem at all. But he didn't. I move on. What was life like in this castle when I was growing up as a boy? Maybe your sorts of ages. Wow, must have been fantastic, mustn't it? My dad owned the castle. Wow. Oh, maybe. I had to go to school. Not like most kids do at school now, though. What do they do? Here, they turn up at nine. They're already home watching the TV at three. They do five days a week. They get 12 weeks at least holiday a year. Oh, sorry, that's not quite enough. Have some training days. I like that. That's training. Back then, we would usually do a 10-hour day. We would often do a six-day week, and they would give us maybe 10 days, five days holiday a year. They worked us hard. So what did they teach us? They taught us to read and write in two, three languages. They taught us all about mathematics, navigation, astronomy, science, many, many subjects. A side subject I would pay really close attention to, though, court etiquette. For you two, probably, court etiquette is how you behave when you're with the king or the queen. 
Elizabeth was a very violent woman, so it didn't do to get things wrong at Elizabeth's court. And by the time boys were around about 18 or so, their family would have found them a wife. Now, what sort of wife were they looking for for them? Were they looking for the prettiest girl in Devon for them? No, of course, sadly not. They did have three things on their mind, money, house and land. She could be 14, she could be 94, bother them, money, house and land. So did the rich girls have an easier life? Take my sister, also called Elizabeth. Well, they didn't usually have to go to school. They would generally be tutored at home. But they would learn to read and write in two or three languages. They would learn to sew, they would learn to sing. They would learn to play instruments like the lute or the harp. And they would learn to keep house so that when they ran their own house, it was an efficient house. And by the time they were 10, they were usually engaged. They didn't usually marry till 13, 14, but they would be engaged at 10. What sort of husband were they looking for for them? Well, of course, sadly, the same three things again. Money, house and land. Oh, title would be nice, but not essential. So I'm afraid, what did an awful lot of them end up with? Old, ugly and rich. <laughs> but I do tell them when I have youngsters in the audience, they wouldn't have had to put up with him for very long because people just didn't live very long back then. Even the well-off would often struggle to get beyond 45 because if the hard life and the violent times didn't get you, the wonderful set of diseases <laughs> carried you off really quickly. They still had plague. They had TB, sleeping sickness, smallpox, sweating sickness, and that's just one handful. They had dozens, and they had two real problems with most of their diseases. They had no idea how they caught them, and I'm afraid once they got them, they had no idea what to do about them. I died of smallpox. I was 35, and I was on a trip to London. One of the cures that the medics of the day came up with was to hang red curtains around your bed. <laughs> I am li so I nearly said living proof. I am dead proof that that did not work. So what would have happened to boy or girl if they turned to their parents and said about the choice of partner, no, I'm not marrying them. I don't like them, no thanks very much. Do you think they'd have sat down and had a nice chat with a hot beverage? Good. A couple of good alternatives would they have come up with? Good, you're getting the hang of this straight away. <laughs> Boy or girl would have been beaten. And they would have been beaten until they said yes. Whether that took the family an hour, a day, a week, a month, they would keep on beating them till they agreed to their choice. Or I suspect quite frequently the kids ran away. It starts to make you think being rich wasn't fantastic all the time. How would I have got on if I was poor? Let's have a think. Oh yes, worse. <laughs> because by the time you were your age, you would be out working full time. By the time you were eight, you would normally have a full time job. Have they started looking for a job for you yet? You're very lucky, or they're very slack, okay? Now, the girls might get the laundry, the dairy, the kitchen. They might clean things, be someone's maid. Boys might get kitchen work. They might be on the farm or out at sea. But they'd be very long hours. How much do you think they paid you for all this work? Would you like a clue? Right, come way, way down, and it's a round number. Nothing. Nothing. Long hours, hard work, no pay, pretty horrible jobs as well. You've got very, very few days off. So do you think they fed you nicely? You are getting the hang of this <laughs> slowly here, aren't we? Yes. Most of the poor lived most of the time on vegetable stew and a not very nice brown bread product. They might have a bit of fatty bacon occasionally. They might catch a rabbit. They might catch a fish if they were lucky. But most of the time they would live on vegetables. I am absolutely delighted to say that we ate rather better than that. 
pork, beef, lamb. Boar, <coughs> oxen, deer, rabbit, beaver. Pigeon, partridge, pheasant, peacock, swan, goose, duck, chicken, blackbirds. We had two large ponds at the front of the castle where we kept river fish like trout and carp to eat. And three miles away, all the sea fish we could want. But the poor generally lived on vegetables. So they didn't pay you. You worked long hours, very hard, not very nice jobs, no days off, pretty poor, poor food. Do you think you got a comfortable bed <coughs> to sleep on? No, you didn't. I'm afraid generally you got the floor. You might get some straw, you might get some sacking, you might even get a couple of planks, if you were lucky, but generally the floor. And if you worked really hard for your masters and you did everything they asked you to do, you might, I am so sorry, but might is the important word in the sentence, you might not be beaten. But they might just beat you because they wanted to and they could. Times were tough. Starts to make. <laughs> he got patted as opposed to being beaten. Yes. You might think nobody had any fun. And I think you might be right sometimes. They did have lots of toys. Girls would play with carved wooden dolls. They had toys like yo yo's. They had hobby horses. They had working windmills. They had games like Nine Men's Morris and Coits. If you haven't had a go, do have a go out in the back garden, they're quite good. They also had bowls and skittles. If you have a go with our skittles in the back garden, please remember it is nine pin skittles set up in the shape of a diamond. It's not ten pin bowling and then wonder where the last pin is. It doesn't exist. The Tudors also invented the cup and ball game. And we got a few of these in the Great Hall. East. That's bad. That's bad. Do go and have a go. Oh, see. Okay. Of course, I practice. This is the sad <laughs> part. Yes, and my wife says, why don't you give up that stupid activity and go get a decent paid job? Yes. <laughs> a lot of the youngsters did also get apprenticeships. They'd be seven years long. Blacksmiths, carpenters, wheel makers, barrel makers. Girls could be things like seamstresses or pin makers and an awful lot of them would learn to read and write and then better themselves in later life. But it was generally a tough time. I move on a little bit and I move on about 70 years to the Civil War. Do you know what the Civil War was here? Ah, the Civil War was a war between the King and a guy called Oliver Cromwell. Let me show you a picture now. I do these pictures. Oliver Cromwell had a bunch of supporters dressed like that called roundheads most of the time on account of the shape of the helmet they wore. The king had supporters looking more like that. So there we are in the Civil War and I come to my cannonball. It is a Civil War aged cannonball. It weighs about four and a half pounds. It's made of cast iron. It's been fired and there were two of them just the same found in the garden when the house was being restored in the 30s. At the same time, the experts on walls tell us that two of the back walls of the castle were rebuilt during the Civil War, particularly one of the old kitchen and one of the tower next to it. So I now feel a story coming on. I've got two facts, two used cannonballs, two broken walls. So one day, a troop of these soldiers with their little round helmets on, the parliamentarians, come knocking at the door. One hundred pounds, sir. I'm sorry, says the man in the castle. Well, why am I handing you money? I live in a castle. Go away. Soldier walks to the side of the castle, waves a white flag. Now, did you notice when you came in up the drive of the castle, there's a big hill behind the castle? Because this was built in a beautiful place to live. It's got a little stream, it's got two wells, and it's surrounded and secluded by trees and hills. It's lovely. If it was a defensive castle, it would be at the top of the hill. But it isn't. And on that day, there are two men up there with cannons. Bang, bang. And the walls start to crumble. Soldier comes back to the front of the castle, knocks at the door again. 200 pounds, sir. 
How much of your castle would you like left before you pay me? Man pays him really quickly. Now, those of you who have done a fair bit of history will say, hang, hang about, Cromwell was, was about power. He was about running the country, running Parliament, getting rid of the king. Yeah, certainly was. But who did he employ to do most of his work at local level? He employed poor soldiers who saw the Civil War as an opportunity to get back from the rich some of the money the rich had been removing from them for a thousand odd years called taxes. Extortion, ooh crikey I keep using words youngsters may not know, extortion is removing money from people by violent means like a robber or a gangster would. Okay. But extortion happened in the whole of England for the whole of the Civil War. So although I can't tell you my story is true, I wish I could. If it happened everywhere else, then it must have happened here in Devon. And I think it's quite a good story. I move on again. Very briefly, though, back to my father, Sir Humphrey. He set up the colony in Newfoundland. Now, what did he physically see when he got there? Not a great deal, really. He, they noted a few natives working off the land, some nice food running around, some very good timber, and a lot of people fishing for cod. If when tonight you go home, you Google Earth for me, Newfoundland, and just look at the satellite picture. You'll see a big grey mountain area at the side, huge area of green, the woodland, the timber is still tremendous. You'll see a few small coastal towns, and if the picture was taken at the right time of the day, you would still see plenty of people fishing for cod, because it was and is the best cod fishing. Now for generation after generation after generation, Devon fishermen particularly, went fishing for cod in Newfound off Newfoundland, every summer. They would sail out in the spring and they would spend the whole summer catching their cod and they would salt it as they went to keep it. They would return back in the autumn but they wouldn't come back here because the British have generally never got on very well with salted fish, didn't like it much then, generally still don't today. But most of the Mediterranean people do like it and they would return to Portugal and Spain generally and they would sell their cargo of salted cod. And they would return back here as much more popular people, generally with a cargo of wine. <laughs> yes. Interesting. Yes, it is. Made more interesting, though, by a chance meeting I had with a very nice lady from Newfoundland two years ago. She'd come to England on holiday. Where was she going to come? Well, here. It's where Sir Humphrey came from. We chatted in the garden on a day like today. It was really nice. They have done a lot of DNA testing in Newfoundland. What they found were rather large amounts of Devon DNA in the population. <laughs> you may well smile. They would sail out in the spring and the whole summer while they were catching their fish, they lived with the family they had in Newfoundland. They would return in the autumn to repair their nets and their boats and they would live with the family they had in Devon. And long before mobile phones and Skype, I doubt these group ever even knew this group existed. <laughs> and that at least kept the peace. Yeah. I move on to the last part of my story for you. When you go around the house, I do hope you will, you'll go upstairs into a lovely room called the solar. Nothing to do with the sun. It comes from French words, sol, to be alone, a room to get away from other people. And a strange French word, salive, which is a room above a beam. So a solar cannot be a ground floor room. It has to be a first, second, third, but nothing to do with the sun. You will see up there a portrait of this gentleman, Commander Gilbert. You can't miss it. It's a large picture and he's standing in a naval uniform. He came here first as a cadet. He was studying at Dartmouth Naval College. His family had told him to come and see the house because they'd owned it for hundreds of years, but actually not for the last 120. He came here and he found a ruin. But even as a teenager, he fell in love with the house on that day and vowed when he had some money, he would return and restore it. 1931, he had some money and he bought the house and a little bit of land around, five or six acres. 
and started to restore it. Well, of course, it was still a ruin. It hadn't got better. So the first thing he had to do was remove all the vegetation and the greenery off the walls. Then he had to put roofs on. They'd nearly all gone. Then he had to put back in floors and ceilings. In the main, there were none left. Then he had to put doors on. Every door you see in a doorway at Compton Castle is a new door. We do have one old door. It's standing next to the old kitchen in a frame. It's about 500 years old, but all the ones in doorways are new. Then windows. One or two did still exist. One or two were lying in the grounds. The rest are new. And then he had to plaster and paint all of the inside of the castle. What he created here was a unique property. Because it doesn't matter where you stand in this castle. Every wall that you're looking at is at least 500 years old. That one, for example, 500. Lots of them are 700. Some are even now approaching 800. But the interior of the castle is less than 90. The Great Hall wasn't finished until 1955. It's two years younger than me. You see, you get to find my age. I'm 66. But he created this unique house with his wife Joan. And when you go up to the solar, she's the lovely lady in the black dress in the other portrait. And they had five children while they were here. The second one was born in 1938, and they called him Geoffrey. And he, now aged 81, is the gentleman that still lives here today with his wife Angela. So my story started to you in 1329, when a Geoffrey Gilbert married Joan de Compton. And my story ends to you today with a Geoffrey Gilbert married to his wife Angela. But I'm going to finish with a question. And I'd maybe have two people who might even answer me. So I, I don't never do. <laughs> <laughs> when would you have liked to have lived at this castle the most? I'll give you four options. Did I just hold three fingers up and say four <laughs> options? Never mind. It's getting late. You can have 1329. Right back at the beginning, all the building works going on everywhere. You could have the Tudor times. Tough times, horrible illnesses. How many of the boys would secretly like to have been pirates with their dad out at sea, though? <laughs> you could have the Civil War. Interesting times. Certainly, if you had plenty of money, the poor would be trying to remove some of it from you. Or I'll offer you today. But I'll tell you three things. Oh, I've got the right number of fingers that time. I'll tell you three things about today. Compton rarely gets a mobile phone signal. You might get the odd minute or two in the back corner of the garden by the magnolia on the odd network if you're really, really lucky. <laughs> Compton's never heard of the word Wi-Fi. Look at the thickness of our walls. We never will. And for the seven months of the year that we're open, you do have 21,000 people walking through your front door. I do hope you've enjoyed my talk. I do hope maybe one or two of you have even learned something. If you have any questions, I'd be delighted to take them now or just come and talk to me any time while I'm walking around the castle up to half past four. I thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. And pass. No charges for these talks at National Trust. This is what we like to do, what we call visitor experience. But if you do think I was worth a pound, go and buy a raffle ticket. And we have a lot of things we're trying to fund that head office do not provide the money for. Wooden benches for this part of the garden. We have one. We need a lot more. And two years ago, the water board dug up part of our orchard and discovered a tiled floor and a wall that we did not know was there. One of the National Trust archaeologists came down very quickly, took some photos and said, I wish to return with a whole team of people. I can't do that for three years. He said, that's the length of work I've got, but that finishes next year. And by the way, it'll cost you four to five thousand pounds. <laughs> Head office do not fund that. That is down to the hard work of volunteers and staff. But I do thank you for your time. Oh, Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry? Excellent. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. I hope you got it all. I did. Good. I love it. Good. Good. Fantastic. Very good. That's no, no one's done that before. <laughs> Filmed it. Really? No. 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 Well, okay.